Welcome back to the hottest show in the galaxy. It's the Karen Hunter Show. We're here on Sirius XM Urban View. We're talking powers and becomes action. And many of you may or may not know, but I started my career as a writer, first as a journalist at the New York Daily News. And while I was at the news, I wrote my first book. I make my own rules with LL Cool J. So that sparked a whole, uh, what do they call that? Ghost writing. I wasn't really ghost because my name's on all of the books. I did a book with him, Queen Latifah, Mason Betha, Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, I did on the down low. I did Convections of a Video Vixen. I did three, four, five books with Wendy Williams. I've done novels. I've been a writer. I've, I've, I've written 30 plus books. I have eight New York Times bestsellers and I've published 30 plus books. And I am now tasked with writing a book right now. And it is wearing me out. I feel like it is not like riding a bike. <laughs> it's not you don't no. just get back on and let me welcome to the show he has a book he's been here before we talked about race and the civil war the next civil war that was his other book the next civil war but i was like he just did a book on writing and failure i need him back let me welcome back to the show the one and only stephen marsh uh, welcome oh, back hey how you doing good good to see you good to see you too i feel like i don't want to talk about me anymore i want to talk about what it's like to write a book with ll cool j Sounds- it was actually uh, so. Let's you know, uh, we were both in our twenties, so it meant, uh, and he was way smarter, and and he was just freaking brilliant. He was one of the smartest people I've brilliant. ever worked with. Brilliant, yeah. like and, and complicated and different and if interesting, sure. but brilliant. And at twenty six, man, listen, uh, to this day, it's one of my best books because I think uh, he participated more than just about everybody that, because I. So I'll just give you the backstory. Uh, yeah. Again, he was 26. So he's out in the streets doing a lot of things. And um, right. it was during a particular time when being sexually pro, uh, you know, prolific was not necessarily healthy. And so, uh, you know, I was asking him questions. He was very guarded. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this book. So I right. ended up making up because I, I didn't know anything. It was my first book. They told me I had a deadline. I finished <laughs> the book in three months. I'm like, all right, dude's not participating. I would show up, sit four or five hours with his grandmother. He would be sleeping. So I wasn't able to get a lot of information from him. So I'm like, I made up like half of the book. I pieced it together. I'm a writer. Right. And I, you know, before I submitted it to the uh, uh, to the publisher, we spent two nights. We did two all nighters where he went through every page and he was like, where'd yeah. you get this story? I was like, I made it up. And then he realized the light bulb went on like, oh, this chick uh, is about to just fabricate my whole entire life. I better participate. So he went through every line, every page for two nights at the Daily News. We were in my boss's office, ordered pizza, stayed there till four o'clock in the morning. I brushed my teeth and went to my desk to work uh, hours later. And it was the the real stories were so much better than the ones I made. Sure. Well, that's always the way, right? I mean, you know, that's always the way in this world. They, the real stories are always better than anything you can make up. I mean, especially with a guy like LL Cool J, obviously. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah who could we, imagine? At this point, I had to like, no, we're not going to tell that whole story. Yeah, no, we're right. going to have to we have to pull back on that Let's one. Get a no, third we of that one. We'll keep a third of that one. <laughs> yeah. Stay out of court. Yeah. Know? Nah, we, we need you to have a career. So yeah. uh, at the point that he realized this book was going to happen and uh, he was going to participate, he needed to participate. He did. He came all in and it was a great experience and it was a New York Times bestseller. So there we go. Yeah. But enough of that. Um, I. Um, I, I've never considered myself a writer because I think journalism is more of a skill and a craft than it is creative until mm. my first book. When right. did you look at yourself as a writer? From the beginning, like from the time I was 12, 13. Okay. I mean, I just always, that's how, how I always saw myself and there was really no other path for me. So I just, um, yeah, like from, from the very beginning, I thought I was a writer and what I it, it even, it even kind of, I mean, I was happy to write anything. You know what I mean? Like I was mm. like, like I like to write it to, to this day. I mean, I still, I like, I write, you know, I wrote the next civil war book you had me on about, but I like, I wrote, you know, I write little essays like this. I write the essays for the New Yorker and stuff. I write short stories that nobody reads. You know, I like to, like, I like to write. And so I, and so I, I, I am a writer for sure. So you get up in the middle of the night with uh, an idea and you, do you have a notepad yeah. next to your bed? Like what's, Sometimes, what's your process? Yeah. Well, it started when I had kids, when I, I started getting up at like four in the morning, right? And then like, just like, that's the only time I could find a write. So I'm still that way. 
I still like, I wake up at about four in the morning. I work until everyone wakes up. I make breakfast for everyone. I do my work. I have a nap every day, which is the secret to life. If you want my opinion. And then you, and then I get, and then I get, uh, and then I, and then I go back and write. That's more my method. But yeah, sometimes I get so obsessed with things that I wake up in the middle of the night. I find like, I don't know about if it's part of being a writer. It is, but I actually just get, sometimes I just get so interested in things that I just, it, it's just electric. I like, I become so fascinated by them that I can't stop thinking about them. You know what I mean? I, I do. That's a good I'm, state to be. Yeah. We're we're similar, except yeah. I don't I, I'm not driven by the writing. I'm driven by the dissemination of the words. Right. Like I, I don't write for the same reason that you write. I'm not compelled to write. As a matter of fact, I hate right. writing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the bane I'm of my existence writer, right now. For sure I am. I'm yeah. a compulsive. It's like I was talking to a friend of mine who lost his house gambling during COVID. And he asked me, like, what's your vice? Because like everyone has a vice, right? Yes. Like and, and and it's like I've never I never really had like, I was thinking about it because, you know, I drink and whatever. Like, I've, you know, gone down certain pathways, but I always come back, right? Like, I never go all the way down the path, if you know what I mean. And uh, and I, I was thinking about it. I was like, I think writing is my vice. Like, writing is my compulsive loner behavior that I have to do that I need to feel right, right? That I need to feel like I'm right with the world. And um, I don't know if that's healthy or super unhealthy, but, you know, mm. what choice do I have? Well, if, if that is who you are, you must do yeah. it. I mean, we're, yeah, exactly. we're, the, the thing that drives you is the thing you were put here to do. Stephen Marsh, you are a writer. Yeah, you are a writer. So um, who who sparked that in you at 12? Was it a book that you came across or was it a you teacher? Know, I had a really, really weird teacher um, in grade six to eight. Who was this? I mean, it's, it's so strange to describe, but he was like, um, he's like a retired military guy. And so you'd come into the room and he made you like stand to attention and like walk around the room. And then he would only allow us to read um, 16th century poetry. So like Sir Philip Sidney, John Donne, Ben Johnson, people like this. And he taught us how to write very rigidly, like for in grade six, it was only sentences. And then in grade five, and then the next grade, it was paragraphs. And then the next grade, it was three paragraph essays. And so it was this very regimented thing, which was, I mean, I'm, I still make my living from what that guy taught me, right? Like, that's like, that's like, wow. like, that's why, you know, that's why if the New York Times calls me up and wants an op-ed, I can do it, right? Like, no, no like, there's no problem with that. But um, then when I hit puberty and I hit high school and I started reading other things, like John Keats just hit me like a hand grenade. Right. And like the and like the and, and like and all these other poets and stuff, just like because I had that, like I was kind of locked in a little world of this very rigid kind of language. And so then when 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 the other when other stuff started coming in, I mean, it just all really hit me. It's like a hard. fire hose, like a yeah, fire hose. It just it, it just like it just blew me away. Right. And 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 that was and it sort of was that that discipline kind of gave me um, which was in. I mean, I've never met a single other person except me who had that education, you know, really a 19th century education, sentence graphs and all that stuff. And, comp, you know, we're starting right declarative sentences, then compound sentences, then compound complex sentences and like all that, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, it, and and it just hit me. It just really hit me. I'm jealous uh, because I feel like maybe I would have been turned on like that, too. 19th century is my jam. The, that that right. genre uh minus the slavery and, and the um colonization but if you know yeah. from a from a literature standpoint a though butt, you know what i mean yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> minus that whatever, minus, but... right minus the fact that my people were in chains but the writing of that period you know yeah. is still to this day you got shonda rhymes out there creating bridgerton off of that you know off of that yeah. period of time because it was so it was romantic it was it was uh you know restrictive but at the same time there was all all of this you know friction and um it's it's a sexy period i i get yeah. it i get i mean to me it was the renaissance to me it was shakespeare and the revenge strategies which i ended up doing my phd on like you know particularly things like hamlet and then um and then uh you know and then and revenge tragedies like uh marlo webster and so on that's and then i you know i was i taught that at city college for a while 
Right. Okay, so I'm sorry, Doctor Stephen Marsh. I need well, to, I need to I am, be respectful. Yeah, but I haven't used it. I haven't used it, it a long like, time. We're gonna I use it I, here because anybody know. that went and got a PhD, you, you're gonna get your doctor from me. I don't. Dr. Stephen I, Marsh I, is here. Honestly, that's the, that's one of the easier things to do is get a PhD. Is <laughs> in it? This, in this, I think so. Well, I mean, compared say, to writing a novel, compared you're saying to writing that, a book without wait, wait, you're saying that as no, well, you're saying that as a person for whom I'm sure your advisors didn't look at you as somebody that not worthy of getting one. And I know several of my friends who have had a hard time with their dissertations with advisors who uh, were super racist and sending them through all kinds of hoops. So, you know, there's a whole new right. world out there. There's a different world than where you come from. Yeah, of Mr. course. Marsh. Well, I come from Canada. So, well, yeah, there, it's there, a very there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the book is called On Writing and Failure. I um, Stephen King is my jam. I, I cut my teeth on Stephen King uh, and Richard Bachman and mm. Thinner and The Stand was one of the first books and was like really thick after Roots. That was the thickest book that I've read. And I, as a t- 11, 12 year old, I was in the world immersed in all kind of Stephen King crazy. Um, and I just fell in love with all of his stuff. And I read on writing a memoir of the craft when I became an official writer. And to this day, it is one of the best books on writing uh, that I think is out there w- until this one. <laughs> right. Were you have you read this? Have you read on yeah, writing? Yeah. A memoir of the- yes. Sure. And I how mean- is this similar or different? Well, you know, I don't want to take anything away from his book because it's really good and it's really frank. But like, you know, it's a different kettle of fish when your experience of writing is being paid several hundred thousand dollars for your first book and never looking back and being able to write like, I mean, you know, being able to write like, you know, Tuja, which he has basically no memory of because he was blackout drunk during the whole time and still making millions of dollars of it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I I find that um, like I wrote this book for people to know what it's really like to be a writer. And I think the mythology around writing is so, um, you know, it's so romantic and it's so like, you know, it, like it, it always implies this, like, like, of course, with Stephen King, like he's a massive success, like, ma- like hugely successful. And writing is really much more about failure than it is about success. Any, any writing career with, you know, with a very, with very, very few exceptions like Stephen King. So, you know, I mean, I don't find like, it's a great book to read. It's certainly a great insight into his experience, but I never found it really useful in in terms of like getting me through the day in terms of like, what does it mean to actually write and to live as a writer? I I mean, I, it just did not jive at all with my experience. Okay. Maybe I was such a fan that, and, and then I'm, Oh, it's excellent. I'm not, I'm not not doubting it. Maybe. Yeah. Your book on writing and failure, Stephen Marsh. Mm-hmm. I say I, I say this all the time that perfection is a process. I think we get caught up in wins and losses in this country, in this world, as opposed oh, to the sure. experience itself. Right. So life is to be lived. You fall, you get up, you bust your lip, you put a band, put a bandaid and get some stitches, keep it pushing, learn something from it. OK, let me step over that crack and not bust my ass next time mm-hmm. for you as a writer. And it is more failure than it is what, what we call failure. I call lessons. I just call them lessons. That's how you learn right. is yeah. through making mistakes, right? Your your biggest failure, Stephen Marsh, in your mind as a writer. Oof. My biggest failure? Well, I mean, I I guess what I've always felt is like I, the the I mean, there's a it's I mean, what I've what I felt, the torture that applies to me, I don't know if it's a personal failure. Like this book is not necessarily about like making mistakes or anything like that, right? But I mean, I have felt like the best things I've written have been the ones that nobody's paid attention to, right? Mm. For sure, I felt that throughout my whole life. Like the things that I, you know, spent years writing. Like I wrote a book called Love and the Mess We're In, which, you know, is absolutely the favorite thing I've ever written of Wait, my own. slow down, slow down, well, you can't Stephen Marsh. It. Spell it. <laughs> love, love where? And the, and the mess we're in, right? And, oh, and the mess you know, we're in. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's just it, like it was only published in Canada because it was the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. No one was publishing anything for like two years. I mean, it's not, th- this is a business where you don't have a lot of control. You don't have a lot of autonomy over your own decisions or or, over the fate of your books. Like, and and that's just, that's just reality, right? Like that's just, that's just part of the the nature of this business. Right. And coming to accept that, I think is pretty hard, but you know, so I don't know if it's 
the worst failure, but I definitely feel like there's a particular part of me that feels like the better I write something, the less likely anyone is to read it, which is really, whereas on the other hand, you know, I can whip off a thousand word column that will be read by 10 million people, right? Like for, for newspaper, right? Like, and that's, and that's, um, you know, it's out of my control and that's, and that, it, but it, it makes it hard to sort of think like, okay, well, it's still worthwhile to write really well and to do what I can to make the best stuff that I can possibly make. Um, you know, even if it, you know, goes to some small literary journal where it's read by 30 people, 15 of whom hate it, right? Like it's, that, that's a, that's a sort of tough thing to face. I know this is your jam because you didn't talk about the next civil war with this much passion. Just going to say it. I'm just going to put it out there, Dr. Marsh. Well, the next put it civil out there. war is a brutal reality. I mean, no one wants to talk about it. <laughs> like it's important to talk about, you know what I mean? Well, also I feel, I don't know about you. But like, I've only talked to a few people about this book so far, but like among writers, I feel like there's a relief in talking about it. You know what I mean? Like you're so used to dealing with, I'm sure you, like you, you're way into this more than the next civil war too. Cause you're sitting there thinking like, yeah, he's right. Like I've, si- I've been sitting here with all my failures, not talking about them, not being able to t- think about them, trying to push them to the side of my mind. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It is the substance of what I do, right? I mean, like that's the feeling I'm getting from this book. I don't know. Like, you know. Yeah. No, a, I mean, you talk about because writers are solitary beings. You yeah, know, you're absolutely. in your own headspace. You may have an editor, <laughs> but it's it's you. It's you. And right yeah. now, the words on that paper used to be, you know, pen and paper used to be typewriter. I've been through all of that. And now it's the computer. It's you <laughs> and your thoughts in the words. And no one can actually help you. This is one. No one can help you do this. This is something right. that you have to figure out, you know. So I want I wanted I was like so excited. The book is on writing and failure. Uh, and I'm gonna make a prediction, Stephen Marsh, that yeah. love and the mess we're in. 50 years after your dead is going to be like a best-selling book. Well, They're going to make it into movies. It's going to be like a phenomenon. It's going to be t-shirts and mugs and your grandchildren will be able to say, my granddad did that. I from bet your mouth you to God's ear. I mean, I bet honestly, you I put it out there. God's ear. Yeah. Well, but, I, I, plan like, I mean, I think around, the other thing so. is you don't, you don't, you don't know the readers. Right. I mean, that's the other thing about being a writer. Like I'm so jealous of like stand up comedians and musicians. Right. Cause they like actually see the reactions to things. Like they see that the people like when you write something like you don't actually it happens in somebody else's soul when they're alone. Right. And so you don't actually see what it does to somebody. And that I think also is, it, you know, it it makes it harder to bear. Right. Like it makes it it makes it so it makes it so much harder to to feel what you're doing as a real activity. Right. Rather than something that you're doing just, you know, in your, you know, in your at your desk, you know, for yourself. OK, Stephen Marsh, I'm, I'm working on a book right now that I can't seem to uh, <laughs> finish. Um, all right. like, Let's talk it through. Oh, Let's get the and discipline I, going here. Let's all right. All right. And here. I and I don't let me tell you how bad it yeah. got this weekend because I, I don't get writer's block. But this weekend yeah. I cleared out seventy five hundred email from my email <laughs> inbox in, instead of writing. The three chapters. <laughs> I clean my baseboards. I think I cleaned out my refrigerator. I might have drywalled uh, a new room. I was doing anything. Right. I went to the supermarket, anything. But and then I would get in. I get up, Stephen. I was like, I'm going to write three chapters today. I would get in front of the computer, and then the emails distracted me. And then I got phone calls, and I was like, I'm turning off everything. And then I was like, I wonder what's happening with uh, this new TV show on HBO Max. Last what of us, I have to watch that or else like what? Yes. Is gonna... What is wrong with me? And I and it's due. It was due last week. Right. So the book was due last week. And in my mind, because months ago, I was like, I figured it out, you know, because it's like, you know, because yeah. you got to put it together. It's like a, a giant puzzle. And then yeah. the pieces started falling into place. And I was like, I'm gonna knock this out. Right. And then. Yeah. Then it didn't happen. Well, you know. I don't need to give you any advice. You don't need any advice because you already know what's wrong and you know what to do here. Oh my God. Right? Well, tell me, yeah, I mean, tell, me do, anyway. right? tell me no, anyway. Tell me anyway. Because I'm, well, oh. you know that, like, first of all, this is part of the process. Like, you know, you're, you're obviously like, this is part of like, you're, you're going to, you need to write it in a different space than you were in that weekend. Like, obviously, 
right? Like that's part of reality. And you're not the first human being on earth to procrastinate over a book. That's like literally everyone who's ever written a book. And if they didn't publish books that were past deadline, there wouldn't be any published books. So you know all of that stuff, right? Like then the other thing you, you know is that you're going to have to you're going to have to dig yourself a deep hole and go into it and finish it. Like you're going to have to find some way it's going to be, I mean, you know, you could pull out all the stops and go to a hotel and turn off the Wi-Fi, but like, you're going to have, like, that's why I wake at four in the morning. I mean, if you're connected to the internet, why on earth would you want to write? Like every movie <laughs> on earth is right there. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, so you're going to have to like, you're going to have to find the space where it's just you alone in a room with the words and wrestle with the angel. You, but you, you already know that. I mean, like, I'm yeah. not telling you anything you don't know. Like, okay. you, you already know so, that that's the process. So for you, um, mm -hmm. you get up at four in the morning. When And I say it's either four in the morning or you, you start at two or three one or two in the morning because there's something to be yeah. said for yeah I, I, i'd look at it like this and i know this doesn't make any sense but i feel like there's a finite amount of energy flowing creativity and yeah. everyone's asleep <laughs> but you, so you have the the forces of all you know you can tap into all of that because yeah. you're not competing with anyone that's the way i look at it well, it's the ding of the phone right i mean that phone it, like there's studies if, you, if your phone is in your room you're done like you become stupider if your phone is in your room, right? And it makes sense because it's like at four in the morning, I'm not going to get an important email for like, there's just nothing. There's just, and similarly at 11 o'clock at night, you're not really going to get an important email. So you need to be in those spaces where you can't, where you can't be in the, where you can't be on the internet, where there's no point being on the internet. That's, that's kind of, you're kind of forcing that to, by being up at four in the morning or, I mean, every pro writer I know is either starts work at like 9 PM or starts work at four in the morning. It seems to be like one of the, yes. other, right? I, like I, I'm, nobody I'm ever late wrote night. anything yeah. at, at three in the afternoon, right? You like, are that's absolutely a, that, correct. Like, yeah. Like no one, like nothing ever happened there at, at that hour of the day. Right. And, um, you know, I think like, I think, I mean, one thing I, I do really believe in sleep. You know, I mean, like, I really believe that there's people who like try not to sleep, like they are proud about how little they sleep. I think that's insane. I think if you're writing, if you're trying to write a book on deadline, you got to get, I mean, eight is a minimum, but you got to, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like uh, eating protein when you're a bodybuilder. You need to, you need to consume a lot of sleep. If you really want to be productive, if you really want to finish those three chapters, like get 10 hours one night, you'll wake up and it'll come. You know what I mean? So that's, I mean, so come on, tell I'm the so truth. Right. You yeah. are so right. Stephen Marsh, you are. And let me tell y'all, I get my sleep. Yeah, Mama does not yeah. play with her rest. OK, don't fool around that's with that. we, yeah, brain yeah. needs the restoring uh, properties yeah. on writing and failure. Now, the subtitle is or on the peculiar perseverance required to endure the life of a writer. Yeah. Talk a little bit about perseverance. What does that look like in the life of Stephen Marsh? Oh, in my case? Well, maybe my problems are, I mean, you know, this book is full of like Dostoevsky being like, you know, the, the Sars and he, he was, he was, he went through mock execution where they like took him out and pretended to, you know, pretended to kill a whole group of people and then said, oh, at the last minute, hey, we're not going to do it. And then he, and then he was sent to prison for four years and he had real problems. I mean, my problems are that I get rejected a lot, but that's not, I mean, as you know, that's just life. Like, that's just like, there's an act. And, you know, one of the things that's great about aging a bit and about, and about learning from experience is that you realize that everybody gets rejected all the time. There's never a place that you get to where you're not being rejected. Mm. Right. Like it's just, it is, that is the nature of this business. Like if you were like, the only thing that changes is who you get rejected by and, 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 and maybe the tone of the rejection, but that's, that's really it. Um, so yeah, my problems are, you know, uh, negligible. The, I'm talking, you know, some of these stories in here are about like, you know, how Machiavelli wrote the Prince after he was tortured. Right. Like that is, that, that required know. real perseverance. Yeah. Okay. And, I, tell me about Baldwin. Novel, 
Tell me about somebody Baldwin, who looks like me. Tell me about Baldwin, Stephen Mark. Well, tell me Baldwin's somebody de- that I love because I don't care about Melville. I'm gonna just let you know. Well, straight there's up. some interesting stories in it because there, there's well, there's you know, I mean, the the sort of basic theme of the book is Baldwin's, right? Because he said like the the opening quote of the book is from Baldwin, where it's like he said. Uh, you know, their talent isn't worth much. I know plenty of talented ruins. What you really require to sur- I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but what you really require to survive in this business is endurance, luck and endurance. Right. And, um, you know, that's a that's a very brilliant phase. I mean, there's also about Alex Haley. There's a, there's a pretty interesting story about him in there where he where he I mean, he, he had a pretty ordinary career until Roots. I mean, you know, a struggling writer career. And then with Roots, there's a scene where he, that where he is being flown in the um, Reader's Digest private jet. And this is in the days when like Reader's Digest like was Lord of me- of American media, right? And they like flew him in a private jet. Would you like a cigar, Mr. Haley? Would you like, there's brandy here. There's like a whole spread in the plane. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, uh, and he, all he thinks about the entire flight is his rejections. And which I just think is like the most amazing test. That's exactly how writers are. It's like, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. You're like flying in a private jet. And all you're thinking about is like, yeah, I really showed these bastards. They rejected me back in the day. And look where I am now. Like, it's 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 perfect like that. Um, But yeah, let me say let me say this. It's not that I don't care about people who don't look like me. But throughout as an English major, I was inundated with everybody that wasn't me until I got to college. Right. And so I yeah. grew up with Taylor Two Cities and Willa Cather and Jack London's racist ass and and all, you know, it's like yeah, yeah. you 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 get indoctrinated into a way of thinking through the lens of other people. And well, Alex Haley, you know, was yeah. was important, not just for Roots, which I read in the fourth grade, fifth He's a grade good journalist, too. Yeah. And the uh, yeah. autobiography of Malcolm X, which has yeah, been a global course, yeah. success. Uh, yeah, yeah as well but uh i just wanted but to see say that. baldwin like you know baldwin is like the master essayist right i mean like he's like he's like the best essayist of the 20th century right i mean you know and the interesting thing about baldwin right now is that he's like you know because he's so involved in political movements we're in this racial reevaluation, so he's been restored in that way but like he's the person who brought the french style of essay into american magazines right like and that's to me is like I mean, that's, you know, they're those those works are just so um, important simply on terms of like the style of the essay. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like this is very I much, I would say, aspirational Baldwin essay on my part. Like, do, do you know what I mean? Like it's I do. Like it's uh, in terms of style. Right. In terms of style. Anyway, let me let me just thank you, uh, because writers again, don't get a chance to talk with other writers like this, you know. I know, it's and, true, right? And it's you fun. did a whole book uh, where you explored all of the possibilities. And I think it's important, anybody listening, what advice do you give to somebody who, you know, the, I get I get these emails all the time, will you help yeah. me write my book? And I say, no, I'm not. Start right. writing your book because part of being a writer is to write. I'm not going to help you. Help yourself. It's your story. Own it. You know, get an editor, but write. What advice would you give to somebody who's I have a book in me? Well, you know, like what Baldwin said is like, there's no advice to give somebody like either you're going to write or you're not going to write and nothing you can say one way or the other is going to help them like go out. You know, I mean, I think the only advice I have, it's not really advice. It's just like a perspective of somebody who's been doing this as a freelancer for like 20 years is that. When you're out trying to make books and trying to sell them and hustling that's it like you're not any different when you're in that moment than ian McEwen, right or whoever like this is it's the good news is kind of the same as the bad news like this is what it looks like there's no place where you're going to get to where it's going to be like you're free and you get to do just what you want and you get and and, you know it's all and it's all it comes all easily like no one that doesn't exist really Right. And uh, and so, you know, I guess the, 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 adv- the advice, it's not really advice. It's just like you have to understand that. This is it, like you trying to figure out how to write your book and try to sell it and try to and try to get it out there. Like if you want to do that's what this business is. It's not mm-hmm. it's not anything else. That is it. And write for your soul. 
not for a market. That's my advice. Well, don't write yeah, for well, a market. Well, certainly don't write for fame or money. Like that's, no. you know, like that's like, like if you're, if that's what you're trying to do, if you're trying to write to get famous and rich, like, please, please stop. <laughs> like, you know, that, there's, there's no point. You're not going to write well and you're not, and it's not, that's not a real sensible way to go about those things. There's a lot better ways to go about doing that. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Stephen Marsh, the next civil war, uh, we, we love that on writing and failure come on through or on the particular, excuse me, on writing a failure or on the peculiar perseverance required to endure the life of a writer. Stephen Marsh, you have done it. You have done it, sir. Thank you for, for being here. Always great to talk to you, Karen. All right. Before you click off, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What's your Real go-to far. for breakfast? What you, My go-to for cook? breakfast? Yeah. I mean, I'm getting old, so, you know, it's like granola. I mean, it's okay. like, it's, all right. It's goodbye. <laughs> That's what you, goodbye. All right. Goodbye. Nice to see you. Come on back anytime. All right. We'll do. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.